I don't want to be involved in conspiracy theories. I, you know, there are lots of them that can go on. We can speculate on that forever. What we really need to know is how, how those buildings came down. My husband Steve was 48 years old when he was killed on September 11, 2001. He was in the North Tower on the 104th floor. There are so many unanswered questions, and that's scary to me. We never had answers. Nobody ever stopped to have a scientific investigation. A scientific investigation. A scientific investigation. Tribute lights in the New York skyline an annual memorial to the lives lost on 9-11. Yet there's still more light that needs to shine, revealing truths that their family members deserve to know. September 11, 2001, a day that changed history. Four planes went silent and off course. Two of those planes crashed into the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Several columns were severed, and the jet fuel ignited fires that spread over several floors. About an hour later, millions watched in shock as both towers were suddenly and rapidly destroyed, killing almost 3,000 people, for whom truth and justice may have yet to be served. Hi, I'm Richard Gage, AIA licensed architect of over 20 years and member of the American Institute of Architects. I'm founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, a non-profit organization of well over a thousand technical and building professionals. According to official government reports, the fires weakened the structural steel framing of both twin towers, leading to sudden progressive and total collapses. Unknown to most people, a third steel frame high-rise, World Trade Center 7, was also destroyed. Critical questions have been raised by more than 1,500 architects and engineers about the official explanations for the destruction of all three of these buildings. Along with more than 10,000 other concerned individuals, these professionals, collectively comprising more than 25,000 years of experience, have signed our petition. They're calling for a new investigation into the destruction of these three World Trade Center high-rises. This call is based on evidence that reveals a very different destruction scenario than reported by government engineers. As coherent sets of scientific facts are brought into focus by the experts, the data, and the witnesses in this film, you'll come to a much greater understanding of the events of 9-11 and will be in a position to draw your own informed conclusions. The new World Trade Center, Building 7, looms above the site of its original. Building 7 was a 47-story high-rise, not hit by an airplane. Yet, it was the third modern steel-frame skyscraper to collapse rapidly and symmetrically on 9-11. It was a football field away from the North Tower and sustained minor damage from falling debris. Building 7's precipitous collapse was blamed on normal office fires. I'm Steve Barish, uh, founder and president of Barish Architects and Associates, Inc., a 33-year-old architecture planning and engineering firm. One of the things that, that really interested me is how quickly the Tower 7 fell. It fell within seven seconds, approximately, from top to bottom. This building was built in the mid-80s and uh, met all the codes at the time. From about 1965 until about 1985, my, most of my experience has been in a high-rise, multi-story steel buildings. NIST would have us to believe that, uh, that these were 
It was a typical office fire, scattered office fires, if you will, that brought this building down. Since the mid-60s, I've tried to follow high-rise fires because they're uh, something we worry a lot about as we design these buildings. And, and I'm not aware of any high-rise building that have come down as a result of fires. The coup de grace for me was when I found out that Building 7 had collapsed later that day. And when I saw Building 7 come down, to me, the fact that it looks like a, a perfect controlled demolition of an intact building I mean, that's what I call a smoking gun. Was the structural steel from World Trade Center 7 preserved, documented, analyzed, according to standard procedures for investigating engineering failures? 400 truckloads per day of material were taken away from the World Trade Center site and sent to China for recycling. There were laws violated in the destruction of that evidence. And for the American Society of Civil Engineers to ignore those events is extremely disturbing and is a violation, in my opinion, of their professional code of ethics. It was contrary to the way all investigations are done. If, if an airplane crashes, they seal off the entire area and nobody touches anything. They move it to a secure location and they reconstruct an aircraft. Normally, uh, when you have a structural failure, uh, you carefully go through the debris field, uh, looking at each item, photographing every beam as it collapsed and every uh, uh, column where it is in the ground, and you pick them up very carefully and you uh, look at each element. We were unable to do that in the case of Tower 7. You can't do science when you are deprived of the evidence and when your hypothesis is the least valid instead of the most likely. When the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned, uh, this is not science. It's trying to prove preconceived ideas. Was a proper investigation performed that might have revealed the use of accelerants or explosives in World Trade Center 7's destruction? NIST concedes that they found no evidence for explosives. So then we asked them, well, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for explosives <laughs> or residues of explosives. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. I'm OK, all right? Here, hold on. You want, call your, you want to call your mother or something? Just the fact that there were explosions means they need to be investigated. Oh boy. You hear that? Keep your eye on that building. It's be coming down. The building is about to blow up. Moving back. We are walking back. There's a building about to blow up. We don't have the real story on what happened because there wasn't a proper investigation done. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. As reported by the New York Times, engineers were baffled by the collapse of Building 7. Since no steel frame high-rise has ever completely collapsed due to fire, how are we to understand this mysterious event? High-rise buildings simply do not collapse due to fire. There has never been until 9-11 an experience where a high-rise building that was steel frame completely collapsed. There have been fires burned longer in similar structures without any collapse. This claims the fires were very large, very hot, and long-lasting, when in reality, observation, which has been researched by many people, shows these fires did, were, did not last very long. They were not in the locations where NIST claims they were at given times. I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. 
for the 40 plus years that I've been practicing architecture. I have designed a variety of buildings from small houses to high-rise office buildings. Some of the high-rises that I've worked on are one shell and two shell here in Houston. I was project manager for a 22-story office building in Akron, Ohio. Later in the day when uh, World Trade Center 7 collapsed, they had already showed us pictures of a few fires in that building and I mean they weren't even raging. And how could that cause a building to collapse as if it were imploded? Couldn't happen. According to lead investigator Sham Sunder of the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, World Trade Center 7 collapsed at freefall acceleration for more than 100 feet of its fall. What does the speed of the collapse reveal to us? Essentially, in less than seven seconds, uh, Tower 7 came down upon itself. It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down for over 100 feet. Which, and the only way if you can get that is when there is zero resistance. And so what we're looking at is a building just coming straight down, falling right through itself with zero resistance. Buildings don't have zero resistance, which is why you feel comfortable walking into a building. This building had 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system, and that is intended to keep it from going anywhere. This is telling us that the building below it ceased to exist uh, for the first few seconds of the collapse of the building. Well, things in physics just don't cease to exist and cease to resist the forces that are on them. The building didn't disappear so the building can fall for 100 feet at free fall speed. That's impossible. That's a, a violation of, of the fundamental law of physics that says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If floors fall, they tend to fall and are braced by the floor directly beneath it. And there's some delay there. Because of redundancy, because of uh, all the other columns in the building that were not affected. Even if a floor were to collapse, it still wouldn't be able to collapse all of the connections simultaneously at the rate that it did without secondary explosions. We might anticipate that an unevenly damaged building would fall over. Yet, videos of the collapse of Building 7 show a fairly symmetrical fall. How do we make sense of this? If the buildings had come down by fire, we would have seen a more natural progression of collapse. And clearly a more asymmetrical pattern uh, should have been present. The symmetry is the smoking gun. It cannot happen that when you have asymmetric damage, you will get a perfectly symmetrical collapse. The exterior columns on the outside, on the outside as well as on the inside, at the bottom would have to be severed almost at the same time. I worked for Control Demolition Incorporated, CDI, the top rated explosive demolition firm in the world. What I saw, it was a classic implosion. The center of the core, the penthouse area, starts to move first and then the building uh, follows along with it. That's another indicator that this NIST report is very suspect. When it's all finished, the outside walls are piled one on top of the other right in the middle of the building just like a house of cards if it were coming down. According to NIST, the failure occurred at column 79 on level 12. This means basically as they're talking about a single columnar collapse or failure that resulted in a total collapse of the building. That just does not make any sense. The explanations from FEMA and from NIST don't add up, but there is enormous circumstantial evidence, circumstantial and actually physical evidence as well, that would lead us to a different conclusion. 
And the conclusion is controlled demolition. Dit is controlled demolition. Zeker weten. Zeker weten. Er is nagesprongen. Dit is een opdracht gebeurd. Dit heeft een team gedaan van experts. Building 7 to me is, is really what gives it away. Because that's a classic case of controlled demolition. This is the original site of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Construction is now underway where dramatic new facilities are being erected. Just 10 years ago, the planes hit the towers, cutting through some exterior and interior supporting structural steel columns. The fuel from the planes ignited office fires across several floors. According to the official reports, the structural steel frame was weakened and failed causing a total progressive collapse of each tower. Does the official explanation make sense? Was there a comprehensive investigation that examined all of the evidence? I walked into the office uh, and the first uh, words that I heard was a plane's just run into the World Trade Center. And my initial thought was, well, that's okay. It's built to withstand uh, a 707. It did not seem possible that these, these towers that were designed to withstand the impact of a 707 could possibly collapse in such a short order of time from the time that they were hit. The majority of the jet fuel was burnt up instantly in the big fireball, and it was gone. The fires that were left were office furnishings and carpet and things like that. A lot of things in these kind of buildings have to be fire resistant by nature. It's required by code. So there really isn't a whole lot of fuel in there to begin with. The media portrayed the, these fires as being extremely hot, but uh, the fires were not that hot in, in World Trade Center 1 and 2. If you look at the NIST's own data, you could see this. And, uh, and to, to use our own powers of observation, you could tell by, by seeing these fires uh, and seeing black smoke come out the windows, that means that the, the fires were oxygen starved and it was incomplete uh, combustion. And so it was a low temperature fire. The heat from the fire supposedly softened the steel and thereby brought the buildings down. If you have a flame at 750 degrees, you can hold that flame under a steel beam forever and you'll never reach a high enough temperature to bend steel, let alone melt it. So immediately I knew at that point that the official explanation was dead wrong. Rather than a slow groaning collapse that we might anticipate, the Twin Towers show in the videos a very rapid, sudden onset of destruction. What does this imply? This claim that the upper section of each of the towers crushed the lower section. However, when you watch video closely, in the case of World Trade Center 1, you'll see that the upper section disintegrates itself it appears to be a controlled demolition of its own, of the upper section. The top section, pushing on the bottom section, it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. You're looking for a jolt that this thing, if it actually comes down and hits, you should be able to see the point at which they actually impact because it would actually slow down the motion of the falling block. Before the tower started collapsing from the top, the antennas started to fall. 
and the antenna, uh, of course, was over the middle of the elevator shafts. I'm very familiar with the interior structure uh, that surrounded the elevator shafts and uh, the accessibility which the elevator companies had 24-7. It wouldn't be a problem once you gained access to the uh, elevator shafts. Then a team of loading experts would have access to all the core columns and beams. The rest could be accomplished at that point by just the right kind of explosives for the job at hand. The only way that I can see that the towers could have collapsed is that the interior columns were compromised. Over a hundred first responders reported sounds of explosions and flashes of light at the onset of destruction of both towers. These were not discussed in the NIST report. What did these eyewitnesses actually see and hear? As we were getting our gear on and making our way to the stairway, there was a uh, heavy duty explosion. Inside the lobby. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. There were numerous secondary explosions taking place in that building. It was con there were continuous explosions. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, yeah, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. And it just started going pop. It just started going boom, 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 boom. And he goes, how fast? They go like firecrackers. They're reporting exactly what I would expect. You're hearing boom, 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 waves of, 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 of explosions going off, not one massive big boom. There's so many videos of witnesses from that day that report explosions. There's radio transmissions from the FDNY. We have the transcripts that were recorded you know, back in 2001 of all these firefighters and first responders reporting explosions. This testimony should have caused the presumption that there was a good chance explosive residue would be found and justified testing for it rather than the opposite. It doesn't look like a collapse. It's like a huge mushrooming, billowing uh, kind of an event. Uh, that whole thing looks nothing like a building falling down. It's a building being blown up. That's what the physics shows. Yet they refuse to consider the possibility that explosives or some other form of demolition device could have been used to cause the collapses of the towers. And the fact that controlled demolition is consistent with all the available technical evidence. And the response to that request for correction is this simply saying they're unable to provide a full explanation for the total collapse, even though that was their task given to them by Congress. FEMA documents a 1,200-foot diameter debris field around each tower. Videos show multi-ton steel sections of hundreds of individual steel pieces ejecting out of the towers at 60 miles an hour for a distance of 600 feet. They also show clouds of debris pulverized in mid-air and isolated explosive ejections as many as 60 stories below the so-called crush zone. Videos also show the near total destruction of both towers. What does all this tell us about the forces and energies involved in the destruction? Large, multi-ton beams were hurled hundreds of yards laterally. Gravity works vertically, not laterally. So something's happening to throw these things horizontally at those kinds of speeds. And here it is trailing white smoke the whole time. It, it really is indicative of um, some kind of explosion. The individual explosions that I noticed 20 and 30 and 40 stories below the collapsing structure. And uh, naysayers tend to say, well, that's just air being blown out the windows. I mean, it doesn't really work to say it's just air pressure. And I estimated these are coming out faster than 100 miles an hour. As an architect, I would expect to see um, 
larger portions of the building floors, uh, the decking, the steel decking, the concrete topping, much larger remnants of what the structural components of this building was. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized, and I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. In its report on World Trade Center 7, which came out in May of 2002, FEMA documents in Appendix C steel that has been melted and even partially evaporated, resembling Swiss cheese. What are we to make of this? I'd like to know why NIST excluded the evidence of melting steel. Well, why is this not included? Why is this forensic evidence not being included in the report? First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like molten bit. steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like lava. Like, like, it was like lava, lava from a volcano. There actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped on the sides of a wall. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. And they pulled out the big block of concrete and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. Many witnesses, firemen, and lots of people described the flowing molten metal, iron or steel, at extremely hot temperatures. And John Gross categorically denied their observations. So that because their observations don't fit his preconceived notion, he not only ignored evidence, he denied evidence. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. And yet we have evidence of molten iron in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, and the metal pouring out of the side of the tower. So what is this molten metal? It's a direct evidence for the use of thermite. An incendiary used by the military Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. I found a pore in the steel that, w that had pure sulfur. There's a government theory that calcium, calcium sulfate from gypsum boards was the source of sulfur, and that's wrong. Uh, calcium sulfate cannot go undergo any kind of a chemical reaction that produces the element sulfur, and we're not dealing with any kind of uh, compound of sulfur. When we're talking about sulfidation, we're de dealing with uh, the element sulfur. There's a version of thermite called thermate which has uh, sulfur in the thermate and what the sulfur does is it, it uh, it's sort of like um, salt on ice. And it just basically makes the uh, steel melt at a lower temperature. And if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition you can find devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolitions. 
In the case of thermite cutting charges, you would have heard far less noise since they are worked by uh, thermal heating, melting of the steel, rather than an explosive cutting as in RDX charges. Overflights had detected uh, with infrared camera 1400 degree Fahrenheit hotspots on the surface uh, of ground zero. And uh, that being there for a week, um, you know, indicates that there was something very hot going on below the surface. So thermite would also explain potentially the fact that the fires could not be put out at ground zero. The fires lasted for quite a while, but um, most importantly, they were deep within the pile where people would expect that the, the environment was oxygen starved. And uh, thermite could explain this because it has its own oxidant within. It's actually the uh, metallic oxide that provides the oxidant to allow the uh, incendiary thermite reaction to occur, even underwater. As much as 6% of the World Trade Center dust consisted of tiny, previously molten iron spheres. What does this tell us about the temperatures generated in the tower's destruction? When the USGS collected samples of the World Trade Center dust, uh, they found the iron microspheres. Insofar, the USGS does not have a valid explanation for the presence of these iron microspheres. So what do the microspheres contain? Uh, Iron is the main element, and then it has smaller portions of aluminum, sulfur, a trace of manganese. Most of them are less than about a tenth in, of an inch in diameter, and they're spherical. And they're found in all of the dust blown out of the buildings during collapse, no matter where in Manhattan the, that dust is picked up. You must have had a much hotter heat source for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit in order to melt the iron to get these molten spheres. Your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. My contention based on finding thermite residue in the dust is that it happened before. It didn't happen after in the, in the fires that ensued in the rubble pile afterwards. It's the, all the characteristics of the microspheres along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found tell me that thermite was involved in melting that, uh, those steel beams. Out of the ashes of the World Trade Center devastation rises the Freedom Tower, whose foundation, however, is shrouded in question. For example, in the World Trade Center dust, an international team of scientists find an advanced form of highly energetic nanothermite composites. What is it, and where does it come from? In the dust, we found what we characterize as unreacted thermitic material in the shape of some very tiny red-gray chips. And uh, in the reaction, they produce molten iron, which is the prime indication of a thermitic reaction. And such a reaction can be used to destroy steel structures. What we have found is a modern version of thermite, which we call nanothermite, which is produced in a different way. It is not just two powders being mixed. The material is actually built from the atom scale up. We call it the bottom up procedure, which is what you do in nanotechnology. The ingredients are much smaller, which means they are reacting faster and they are more easily ignited. The primary elements in the red material are aluminum, iron oxide, as well as silicon and carbon. The iron oxide appears in fasted grains, approximately 100 nanometers across. The aluminum appears in thin platelets, about 40 nanometers thick. 
This is discussed in our paper in the Open Chemical Physics Journal published in uh, April of 2009. But so far, none of these uh, papers have been refuted in the literature, the scientific literature. So that means they are unchallenged in the scientific sense. They stand as a, an indictment, really, of the official story of 9-11. We also took paint that came off of the WTC steel and looked at that in the SEM and, and did a compositional analysis of that and found that it was not similar to the red-gray chip or the red layer of the red-gray chips. This cannot be paint. Paint does not have these exotic properties. It's impossible. This is material that is, uh, is of military use that really shouldn't be there. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. Any honest investigator would be looking at this and looking for explosives and so forth. The NIST investigation didn't go there. They just would not look for explosives. This has been uh, the work of independent researchers, not NIST. So the preconceived notion of NIST is that there's no evidence for explosives and so there's no point in looking. Uh, that is the most unscientific thing that you can possibly think of, not to look because you don't expect to find evidence and in fact the evidence is overwhelming that these red-grade crystals are very high temperature incendiaries. They state these conclusions for which there's virtually no evidence and then they ignore conclusions that can be drawn from the evidence. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives, in other words, controlled demolition. We have a professional responsibility and I urge every engineer and architect and demolitions expert and anybody that has any knowledge in this field to examine the evidence and stand up and be counted because the rest of the world is depending upon us. We know we've been lied to about 9-11. Uh, we don't know for sure who did it. We don't know exactly how they did everything. And that's why we need a new investigation to find out. We do know that there was a massive cover-up, that there was evidence hidden and destroyed. The American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. some kind of uh, consciousness raising on my part before I was willing to look at the, the possibilities. And really, you need to go where the evidence leads. Let's look at it objectively. Let's look at the evidence, not these fabricated computer models and hearsay and all these predetermined conclusions. Uh, let's really open it up again and um, investigate this thing properly and then come to conclusions. I strongly support a, an independent investigation that would be independent of the government, independent of all of the influences that obviously were in effect uh, during the NIST investigation. What happened on 9-11 is not something that is just going to go away. This is very pertinent to us today. I wish to further the investigation and I want to make a difference because I want this to be a safe and better place for my children. Sign the petition on the uh, Architect and Engineers 9-11 Truth uh, website mainly because I wanted to uh, stand behind the families that lost people on 9-11. Uh, the 9-11 Truth movement was started by the families 
uh, that lost loved ones on that day. And they were all out there alone, screaming for help. And our own country was ignoring them and ignoring their needs and not taking care of them the way we should have after that happened. Most of us who have lived with the events of 9-11 have, as a result, experienced some kind of trauma. It can be very difficult to come to terms with what actually happened at the World Trade Center. In fact, someone told me recently, I wouldn't believe what you're telling me even if it were true. Our petition signers with psychological expertise have stepped forward to offer their insight. While this segment is clearly outside the knowledge base of the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, these experts in psychology highlight their valuable experience for us as to why this evidence can still be so difficult for people to accept. As we know, the horrors of what happened on 9-11 were televised all over the world, and they were televised, in fact, live. We witnessed the deaths of almost 3,000 of our fellow Americans. We know this had a very um, severe and traumatic impact on a large a majority of the population. At this point, we have nine years of hard scientific evidence that disproves the government theory about what happened on September 11th, and yet people continue to be either oblivious to the fact that this information exists or completely resistant to looking at this information. So the question becomes why? Why is it that people have so much trouble hearing this information? From my work, I think we would be remiss not to look at the impact of trauma. Many people respond to these truths in a very deep way. Some have a visceral reaction like they've been punched in the stomach. To begin to accept the possibility that the government was involved is like opening Pandora's box. If you open the lid and peek in a little bit, it's, it, it's going to challenge some of your fundamental beliefs about the world. If we can think of our worldview as being sort of our mental and emotional home, I think all of us will do just about anything to defend our homes, to defend our families. And, and so I see that with people, and I saw that with myself when my brother tried to talk with me about it, of don't mess with me, don't mess with my home, don't mess with my comfort with how things are. And about a week later, I read a lengthy article by Professor Griffin um, about why he believes the official account of 9-11 cannot be true. And it was a very well-researched article. It was in my office at the time. I sat there and I felt my stomach churning. I thought maybe I was going to be sick. And I leaped out of my chair and ran out the door and took a, a long walk around the block, around several blocks, um, and just broke down. I understand now that what was happening was my worldview about my government being in some way my protector, almost like a parent had been dashed and uh, it was like being cast out into the wilderness I think is the closest way to describe that feeling and I sobbed and I sobbed felt like the ground had completely disappeared beneath my feet and and I knew at some point during the walk that I knew that I was going to have to become active in educating other people about this that there was that for me to retain any sense of integrity I was going to have to take some action. I couldn't just let something like this go. When we hear information that contradicts our worldview, social psychologists call the resulting insecurity cognitive dissonance. For example, with 9-11, we have one cognition, which is what the official story of 9-11, what our government told us, what our media, media repeated to us over and over, that 19 Muslims attacked us. On the other hand, we have what scientists, researchers, architects, engineers are now beginning to tell us, which is that there is evidence that shows that the official story cannot be true. So now we've lost our sense of security. We are starting to feel vulnerable. Now we're confused. 9-11 Truth challenges the beliefs that our country protects us and keeps us safe and that America is the good guy. 
When your beliefs are challenged, fear and anxiety are created. In response to that, our psychological defenses kick in and they protect us from these emotions. Denial, which is probably the most primitive psychological defense, is the one most likely to kick in when our beliefs are challenged. And it's a very, very uncomfortable state to be in. And eventually, our mind shuts off. Just like when a computer is overloaded, our minds get overloaded. We can't handle it anymore, and we shut down. And what some of us will tend to do is deny the evidence that's coming our way and stick to the original story, the official story, and to try to regain our equ equilibrium in that way. Another thing we can do is decide to look at the conflicting evidence and s be sincere and be open-minded and look at both sides of the issue and then make up our own mind about what reality is. Here are a few of those, ob those spontaneous initial reactions to hearing the contradictory evidence about 9-11. I don't want to know the truth or I'd become too negative and psychologically go downhill. I'm not sure I want to know. If this is true, then up would be down and down would be up. My life would never be the same. Fran, I refuse to believe that that many Americans could be that satanically treasonous. Someone would have talked, but these are beliefs. They are not scientific facts, but these beliefs do keep us from looking at the empirical evidence. Whenever we say, I refuse to believe, we can be sure that the evidence that's coming our way is not bearable and that it's, going, it's conflicting with our worldview much too much. As I thought about all of these responses, I realized that what is common to every one of them is the emotion of fear. People are afraid of being ostracized, they're afraid of being alienated, they're afraid of being shunned, they're afraid of their lives being inconvenienced, they'd have to change their lives, they're afraid of being confused, they're afraid of psychological deterioration, they're afraid of feeling helpless and vulnerable, and they're afraid that they won't be able to handle the feelings that are coming up. None of us want to feel helpless and vulnerable. Healing comes through ex facing the truth, experiencing it, allowing the feelings to come in, so that if there are feelings of fear that perhaps these events were caused by something that we haven't thought about yet, dark elements within our society, for example, we'll let that come in and explore it. Let the light shine on whatever happened. This will be the most healing process. After World War II, uh, part of the way that uh, Jewish people honored the dead was by making sure that the truth was known and that the value of these people was respected. Not pursuing the truth about 9-11 disrespects the value of the life of the people that died. Thinking that we're above uh, such things, that it could happen in other countries, but it couldn't happen here, that's a lack of humility, and that's excessive pride. And so not being able to see our dark side or our weaknesses is the most dangerous thing. A feature of American history that makes us uh, particularly uh, liable to this pride is this notion that's, of, that's called exceptionalism that America is the exceptional nation. And that began from the beginning as, the, as this country was uh, formed. Uh, the people would say, well, there was so much evil in the European country, so much uh, cheating, so much uh, lying, so much uh, using the people for the ruler's purposes, but not in America. We have leaders that are free from those sins. So I think this has made 9-11 um, particularly difficult for Americans. So we need to understand that questioning is, uh, is patriotic. 
Questioning is what we're supposed to do as citizens. That's our duty. When something like 9-11 happens, we need to be sure that we have a real investigation into who the perpetrators are, and then we need to be sure that those perpetrators are held legally accountable. It's part of the healing process on the individual level as on the collective level. We need the truth in order to heal. My name is Bob McElvain. I'm from right outside the Philadelphia area, and I'm the father of Bobby McElvain, who was killed in the lobby of the North Tower on September 11, 2001. Bobby was one of the first 10 bodies found. We took him home that week. We were one of the few. I finally found the doctor who examined him. All his injuries were in the face, the front of his face, his face was blown off, massive cuts in his chest and his right arm were blown off. To me, that means explosion. What happened on September 11th was the tragedy, where Neil was on flight 175, and it crashed into the second tower. And I can't imagine what happened to him. My brother was my best friend. David has always been a firefighter. My brother went in to save people's lives. I'm a family member trying to find out the answers to the murder of 3,000 plus people. I'm Jane Palacino. My husband Steve was 48 years old when he was killed on September 11th. I have no identification. You know, why is that? It seems to me we should know why over a thousand victims there are no trace for and no identification, no trace of over a thousand victims. Just a few years ago, they were still finding body parts on the roofs of buildings. What is that? We should know why there are over 700 bone fragments found on the top of Deutsche Bank building less than a half an inch long. We should have that information. Why were they up there? Why weren't they found? What kind of explosion was there? And the explosions were brought up many a times, talking to firemen, talking to medics, talking to everyone. Everybody talked about these explosions. I want the officials that are in, in power to ask the questions. I want answers. Please look at architects and engineers, people all around the world, scientists all around the world are questioning this. When you bring science into the equation, that's so important because you can't argue against science. And there's some deep, deep explaining to do. The bottom line is that it needs to be investigated properly. We will never heal. This country will never, ever, ever forget that day. We have to demand a new investigation. I want justice here. The forensic evidence that you've seen is very real. New light has been shown. A third beam now reaches into the pitch black sky and stands in for the still officially unexplained free fall destruction of the World Trade Center Building 7. The obvious dark truth about Building 7 may very well provide the key to justice for the victims of family members of the destruction of the Twin Towers. The country owns this. We were all victims. You would all, you all should want answers. It's not just, not just ours, not just mine. We all lost something that day.